The following content is provided by MIT OpenCourseWare under a Creative Commons license. Additional information about our license and MIT OpenCourseWare in general is available at ocw.mit.edu. This, this setup where uh, a person could get a contract from the city uh, to put a plow on the front of their SUV oh. and the plow people out of their driveways yeah. and that was free for the I mean, you know, and they would get they would get paid, paid for it. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, nobody was ever late for work by reason of the well it, it, even better than that you just go down and knock on the person's door <laughs> tell them when you want to go and they would just automatically yeah. And, uh, okay, why don't we get started with some uh, housekeeping issues? First of these will be your reactions to the uh, updated syllabus. Oh, how did that happen? Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no. With the grading scheme at the end? With the grading scheme at the end and the, uh, took off the uh, midterm. class for graduate students uh, I just don't see a whole lot of point in asking y'all to memorize memorize a whole lot of terms for a midterm because anybody can do that right. <clears throat> it'll come out I do it'll come out uh, in this paper uh, what I want for you to do is to walk away from this class with as much of what we put into the class into one coherent whole that is your choice of topic um, and we're going to work, if I say work with you, that is not right. We're going to work on you <laughs> to get that thing right. So that's, uh, that is uh, the importance that I put on that. Keep talking. You still got the floor. We're still we're doing some housekeeping issues on the, uh, on the syllabus. Uh, This is not exactly yours. Yours is hardback. I couldn't buy a hardback. But I want to keep the one that is uh, property of. Is that okay? Can I give this one back to you? Oh, I see, because you wrote stuff in it? No, you wrote stuff in it, and I want to keep it. Oh, I see. I see. Stolen from. <laughs> Stolen from. Right. You like that. Yeah. But they, when I ordered it, uh, they, didn't order, they didn't get me the hardback. That's fine. Okay? Okay, uh, so uh, the percentage of, we're gonna and and let's see. Oh, open up again to. Um, you have it in front of you. Okay, uh, the part where. Yeah. Okay, the early presentation and the final presentation. Uh, do you have any questions about that? So the early presentation is on the same. It was uh, draft one of the same thing. Okay. All right. Um, and there are two prep classes. So I want to have a class that pretty much gives you a higher order uh, um, explanation of how to give a verbal presentation. Now, what's going to be very helpful with the prep classes are the other two faculty or any other faculty that are here. They're going to have different styles. You may want to use one of theirs instead of one of mine. 
or instead of, yeah, I have several styles. But um, uh, please take advantage of that opportunity to work with them. Okay, uh, we're going to be able to do some, at some classes more than one case study in one period. So we'll, that'll be ad hoc. Some of them we'll get stuck on. Some will move straight through. But you're ready to do two of them today, right? Three of them. A7D, Challenger, and what was the other one? Pinto. Okay. Um, let's see. There's another housekeeping issue. Um, uh, I was not able to consummate a um, person who, to take over class on Thursday. I'm going to be out of town. Now, we have some options. We can get a volunteer to take the class. We can uh, schedule a makeup class, which is what I'm accustomed to doing at Howard. We schedule makeup classes on some time that's convenient. Um, any ideas? Uh, like, for example, a Friday or, like, for example, during the final week. Either one? I'd probably prefer a Friday earlier in the semester. Thanks. Okay, why don't we do this? Uh, you all are talking to each other outside of class? Yeah. Okay, come up with a couple of options. Okay. And then when we get together the next time, we'll explore those options and see how many people we can get in. <coughs> okay. Uh, there's one other day when I'm going to be on travel, uh, but that day I will promise to have somebody come in, take the class. Um, and that's all for me. I, won't, I have no other plans to miss any other classes. This Thursday, this Thursday there's no class. Okay, uh, let's see, are there any other housekeeping issues? All right, uh, a couple of, uh, before we get involved in the, um, in the case studies, uh, let's have a revisit uh, uh, of the last class. Let's have a revisitation to the last class. Um, and revisit means uh, several things. One, are there any questions you want to bring up? And second, uh, are there any uh, corrections that need to be made? There's one correction I want to make in something that I said. Uh, remember, there was a question asked about, is it really, uh, is it an end that you feel for somebody else? Or is the end really that you're feeling for yourself? And I had said that Schopenhauer gave this example of how a person cannot, sometimes does not separate oneself from someone else. Okay, now there's a, there is a slight amendment that I would like to make to that. And it's very slight. And that is that Schopenhauer set down the theory but it was Joseph Campbell that gave the experience. <laughs> okay. And Schopenhauer did it. Hold on just a second here. I'll tell you what. Uh, yes. Schopenhauer's book called The World as Will and Idea is full of uh, this kind of discussion. Here we go again. The will again. Okay. You can take note of that. So you're in German authors, you're going to find a lot of this issue about the will. <coughs> the book is a symphony of rapture dealing with this matter. He uses an image that I like to bring up in relation to this and his uh, foundations of morality. He asks, quote, how is it that a human being can so participate in the danger and peril of another that forgetting his own self-protection, he moves spontaneously to that person's rescue, end quote. How is it that what we take to be the first law of nature, preserving this separate entity, this ego, is suddenly dissolved? 
and as though one were at were that other. I'll repeat that. As though one were that other. Uh, one acts spontaneously in the interests of that other, even at the risk of one's own life. One acts spontaneously to save a child that's about to be run over. Schopenhauer answers by saying, this is a metaphysical realization that has broken through, which is usually not there, end quote. It's the realization of the universal consciousness of which we are all manifestations. Now notice that universal consciousness, universal, universal consciousness, this business of there being uh, a oneness to the universe is going to come up. Yes, it's going to come up. It's basically the mystical tradition that where the oneness plays such a big role. And it's very German. Uh, very German. Uh, I mean, nowadays, uh, yeah. it's much more popular. Uh, it's also very profound. Yes, it's also very profound. Uh, I just bought a book uh, on oneness. Um, it's, I'll get it in the mail at some point. I'll bring it to class. Uh, it's a relatively new book, and the person who wrote it is, our, is a physicist. I was out at the AAAS meeting weekend, uh, 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 last weekend, and um, they had a book sale, the, you know, the display, and I bought it there. Uh, it seemed to be going quite popularly. Uh, so I'll bring that to class, but it's a physicist's point of view that there's a leap you can make, even in physics, that... I think what, what he's really saying is that some of the great physicists have already made that leap. They really think that there's something out there that's a oneness uh, of the whole universe. And there is this discussion that I don't understand very well, and I hope you do, and if you don't, it'll be in this book and we'll discuss it. There is this discussion out there that there are forces between every two particles in the universe, but those forces, the magnitude of those forces uh, is independent of the distance between the particles. That's very hard to accept. Einstein has something to do with that. <laughs> okay. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, so the correction is that the actual experience of the bridge, of the person falling over the bridge was Joseph Campbell's experience when he was a young man, but he puts it in uh, the uh, context of Schopenhauer's works and justifies it there. Okay. Um, anything else? Uh, Dr. Ng had an issue that I don't think that I responded to um, thoroughly, and I would like to make it a, a class responsibility to respond to it thoroughly. You want to put that question again? about Kant and how in his um, philosophy there were these things that were considered to be always that held all the time that they were called uh, the imperatives the, the categories of imperatives so if you have an op if you have an imperative then you operate by means of the imperative all the time and I think the example we talked about had to do with if the imperative is I will s always steal then there will reach a point where there's no more and then, therefore, the imperative, that cannot be an imperative because basically you can't fulfill it. But then my question was, well, can you have an imperative, basically, I will always steal, uh, and yet not be able to fulfill it? So is that consistent? As opposed to saying that uh, because you can't fulfill it, you can't have the imperative. Maybe, can you have the imperative, just there's no opportunity to enforce the imperative? Uh, maybe uh, it would it be fair to say that you're saying that it's logic, it's, it still remains logically possible, but physically it doesn't remain possible. Is that what we're talking Elaborate, elaborate. Let's get some response. Anybody? Well, Jump in this. Excuse, feel... excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Remember, class participation is part of the grade. <laughs> <laughs> get in. So my reaction to what you're saying is that the way Professor Broom presented a categorical imperative was 
that by definition, it can always be able to be done. So the question you're posing has sort of already been answered by defining an imperative as something that physically can be done. But now if we bring in the differentiation between logical and logically being able to be done and physically being able to be done, then maybe my response doesn't hold. But if the definition is that a categorical imperative can always physically be done, it seems like we can't have a categorical categorical imperative that you just want to do but can't at that moment. Uh, let's 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 go, let's keep on let's keep with this a little bit more. Um, actually, uh, I, I happen to like Kant. He's viewed by many as the greatest philosopher of the last two hundred years. Let me give you another view of Kant. Um, right. We have, you know, a field called cognitive science. Yes. We're trying to figure out something about how people behave. If you were to restate the category of imperatives in the following way, that people are genetically predisposed to do certain things, different people are predisposed to do different things than other people, okay, rather than make it axiomatic okay. in, in a logical sense, then Kant is really uh, the first one to actually say that. Anything like that. Because the genetics didn't exist in those days, there wasn't any Darwin, etc., etc. To, to, to sort of say that people are predisposed, and this is not the word he said, but what I'm creating, to, to do certain things, it, it was, it, is a real significant discovery. That's, that's point one of it. The other point I wanted to make is that if you look at the title of his famous uh, book, which was uh, Critique of Pure Realism. Okay, where he's criticizing Hume. So it's, how do you say that this guy is a logician when the title of his major book is a critique of pure reason? Okay, all right. I'll just leave that one open. That was, okay. Uh, yeah, was he remaining, as I, as I say, was he remaining faithful to his discipline when he wrote that? Being a logician, did he? I tell you what I get, what I really think now, listen to me carefully, I'm saying what I really think when I, I get my own opinions. What I really think that Kant was after was a set of Ten Commandments for ethics. Not, a, not everything, not a, not a long list of imperatives, but a short list from which you could reason out your ethical uh, uh, choices. I really think he was looking for a short list of very uh, snap, short, snappy statements. Do this, don't do that. When I was in the Army, that's the way it was. Believe it or not, there were 10 rules. <laughs> not 11, not 9. There were 10 rules of how to survive uh, in combat. Okay. One was, I don't remember one of them. Never let the enemy encircle you. Okay. Well, you see enemy might encircle you no matter what you do. That goes back to what Dr. Ng was saying. Okay. Nevertheless, there is this compulsion. There's something that really works for us when you can just lay out that magic number, 10 do's and don'ts. Everybody can remember them, and they try to live by them. Now, let me make a few comments on that. Um, I was reading someplace where even Kant said that you want to set up a life pattern using these categories. Uh, and that guides you when you're walking down the street, if a kid jumps across the street, you know automatically what to do. But a lot of your problems are going to be the ones that you're going to have to sit down and look at as particular cases, particular physical cases. So he did give that away, that, that, that both of, there's a place for both of them in a person's life. All right, okay. Um, so I think that a good life is one that can find a way to use both of them. Um, let's see. 
There was something else I was going to say, but I, when I get the spirit, I'll just say it. <laughs> it'll come later. How about we get back into uh, some of these cases? Um, let's make a few remarks to end up, and then you all want to give me some uh, 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 homework, don't you? Uh, how do you, how do you want to give it to me? Your hard copy? Okay. Yeah. Let me have them. And okay. And I'll work on these. Let's see, since we don't have class Thursday, um, I can probably send comments back over the weekend on email. And um, uh, let me see if we can't make a few comments on this while we're at it. One is that how did you treat the point that if you use a utilitarian approach on A7D, the fact remains that nobody actually got hurt. Uh, how do you treat the issue that if I am uh, 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 Kermit Vanderveer and my boss tells me to falsify this data, and I say, but that's telling a lie, and then he comes back and says, well, no matter what the military rules are, Nobody's going to get hurt in this. Comes close enough. Nobody's going to get hurt. How do you react to that? How did you react to it, and how, do you, and, and how would you recommend that the rest of us act to that? Does utilitarianism fail us here? I didn't know what to do with the fact that we already knew the results. Yes. Um, and we and we knew sort of insider information that the main character in the case didn't know. Right. So what I decided to do was to narrow the scope and just do the ethical analysis as if Lawson or Van de Vier were making the ethical decision. And so they didn't have knowledge. Um, you know, at that point in time, they didn't know that okay. the brakes wouldn't be installed. So that's how I chose to deal with it. Right. Um, but then that was one of the problems, because after the fact, we yes. do know that no one was hurt, so the greatest utility. Yeah, I actually did the same thing, Kristen, and I really? assumed that we didn't know the outcome, and it was right. just for them that one decision they had to make. And I really felt like utilitarian kind of failed in that sense. I mean, I think for probably many engineering cases, it's probably not the best approach to take, I felt. Number one, because there's so many uncertainties to the outcomes. I mean, so there are probably not too many engineering projects when you can say, these are the costs, these are the benefits, this is what's going to happen. There are so many things that you don't really know. And I mean, retrospect is nice. We can say, okay, it didn't turn out that bad. But if they're making that decision then, I had a problem. We don't really know what could happen. What could happen with these breaks? They could, get off the runway, people could be killed, we don't really know. So Right. There's costs and benefits, but each of those costs and benefits has a probability exactly. to whether or not it actually happens. Uh, so therefore it seems that uh, utilitarianism is going to um, uh, be a way of looking at the world where you can resort to probabilities. Whereas the categorical imperative is either A or B. Right. That's what. That's why the categorical, the, the ontological approach or the principle-based approach, for me in this analysis, seemed less shaky in terms of coming to a conclusion because I could just say. Don't lie. Yeah. Don't lie, or in my case, yeah. Don't. Don't endanger. Don't infringe on the right of someone to their life. There is an, uh, have we satisfied or satisfactorily treated your question, Dr. Dean? Okay, because I'm jumping a, around here a little bit. Um, I want to play uh, one more game with the A7D case. Um, and, let's play, and, and this is a game that comes up. Uh, a lot with utilitarianism in engineering. You don't find it so much in science. And that is that the person who's making the decision 
is making the decision in a very large, powerful, hierarchical environment where he or she is somewhere down in the middle towards the end, bottom. And so the question then becomes, is the decision maker, I'm going to put this question to you, is the decision maker one of the affected parties to his or her decision? I will tell you how that gets to be a big issue. This is what they call whistleblowing case. Uh, in engineering ethics, uh, I think uh, we will not find any category of problems that is, is as great of uh, an issue in terms of um, hostility that engineers can have for one another than whistleblowing. This business of loyalty to the corporation or to your employer or to your client is a big deal for us. Right? So the question then, then the issue comes up called blackballing. That's a formal term and it's one word, blackball. Uh, what that means is that this invisible power structure in, in engineering practice that runs from this employer to that client to that employer uh, is one in which it can punish a, wish, punish a whistleblower by saying you'll never get another job after you've blown the whistle. There is some structure to that. It's called the resume. That when you go to, from one job to another, you have to send your resume and you have to have some persons from your other job to make some, you know, have to give some, rec some references. So they call back to that person. That person says, oh, she blew the whistle on us. Right? And they say, well, you know, we looked at your application. <laughs> it looks very good, but we decided on someone else. And then after a while, you'll see a pattern in your life. And that turns out to be a very stressful pattern. So is it fair? Is it right for the decision maker if that person wants to use utilitarianism to consider him or herself as, a, as an affected uh, party? Is that a legitimate thing to do in utilitarianism? All right, well, let me ask you to do something. Let's see, how can we do this? Uh, suppose, suppose I am Vanderveer. Okay. And suppose one of the pilots out there is your son. And I say that, well, if I, make, if, I, if I don't tell this lie, I will get blackballed. How do you feel about that? Do you think that I have a claim? No, not if it's my child, I don't think you have a claim. <laughs> and maybe that's the problem, because everybody has certain biases, and everyone has a way of saying general overall good. Because if my son dies, the overall good in the world is, is you know, drops in. And then for you, you know, you still have your job, maybe you experience some kind of financial gain. So maybe like our perception. All right. What I'm going to what I'm going to do at this point is tell you that um, this is where uh, John Stuart Mill fits in, and why he, and my judgment is why he gets more credit for utilitarianism than Bentham, and even all the way back to Plato why it is. And that is, it, John Stuart Mill goes into that kind of question. What really counts as the, as the maximum good? Is good really a matter of feeling good 
or is there something that's different? Uh, is there something about worth feeling that you've done something of worth that doesn't necessarily make you feel happy? But what does it make you feel? So uh, try to pick up something that John Stuart Mill has written or that somebody comments on John Stuart Mill and go into some detail about the happiness principle because he takes into account all of these kinds of ramifications. Uh, how about <clears throat> let's, looking at, let's look at another case. Want to do the challenger? Let's do the challenger. Uh, let's see. Give us a recapitulation of the case, someone, some two persons. <laughs> what? Give us the time, the day. What happened in that case? Act as though the rest of us really don't know. Ratliff, you got to want to add something to that or correct or not correct or change your no, view I, on something else? No, I think Chris is saying it very well, but I think there's a, a well-known quote. I'm going to get it wrong, but I think the management tells um, the engineer to put on his management hat. There. Like that. Ah, <laughs> that's the and, famous line. And yeah. so it really kind of... Go into it with some detail on that, please. Um, right, right, because he goes in saying, you know, don't want we we don't need to do this, we don't have such data. And then he... Excuse me? Mm -hmm. Now, we're talking about the Vice President for Engineering. Okay. And he's sitting at a table with some of the other Vice Presidents and the President. And he gives this opinion that says, don't fly, now keep going. Okay. And I guess he has various reasons, and then that's the response, put on your management hat. If you were a manager, you know, see it from our point of view. Right. We have to do this. And eventually he says, okay. All right. Get that. Now, remember when we talked about story terms? And I said the causative sequence, the point, the point of view. You see, and we talked a little bit about uh, 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 Moby Dick and how it starts. The first words established the point of view. Call me Ishmael. Now you know. The whole story unfolds through that person's eyes. I can't think of a better case where a point of view can really change how you look at something than this change, put on your manager, take off your manager, put on the other hand. Okay, there's a point of view in it. So now the question then, another question comes up about this is that before we get into it, and I want you to address this, is whether or not a practicing engineer should 
uh, obey a different moral code from the manager. better state of the engineering manager. Is there something different about their ethical responsibilities? Or do they have the same responsibilities? Uh, let's see. Let's, 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 uh, uh, put some, let's put some uh, flesh around those bones. Um, let me see. Do you all remember that day? What were you all doing that day? Do, do some of us old people can remember that day just like it was yesterday. I remember it. Coming home from school. Kindergarten. Yeah. I just remember the scene on the TV. Now that's another thing that you, that you all can. They played it on television again, yeah. again and again and again. Right. Um, did did it numb your senses senses at all to see it over and over and over? Or did it do something else? How do you feel about it? You remember this? Well, I was just five years old, so I five didn't years have old. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I remember that day very well. Um, when it happened, I was in the library. Uh, is there somebody over there? Okay. Oh, yeah, come in. The when it happened, I was at the Library of Congress. And I was sitting in the uh, reading room in the, techno uh, the technology um, building. Jeffersonville, and not exactly a large reading room as the Library of Congress goes, but maybe the second, second or third largest one. And I'm just sitting there reading, and librarians in the Library of Congress um, tried to be as unhelpful to the readers as they could be. <laughs> Uh, unless unless you come there to use unless you're going there to use the rare book division uh, unless you were there from a congress person just sitting on the floor but this day this librarian yells out for everybody and says Dr. Broom I don't know how they knew my name he said I think I know they described me they said they want you on television down there well Howard has a TV station So I run down there, and they're putting on the microphones, and it was a live show. Uh, and they, I said, well, what am I, they said, the dean had given them my name because I had a NASA grant. I said, okay, what's going on? They said, we'll show you. <laughs> I, saw the, I saw the film two minutes before I was supposed to comment on it and take phone calls. <laughs> And I sat there, and they played it one more time for me. Uh, what I got fixated on when they showed it was the, uh, the pictures of the people in the audience, the parents, as they saw the thing explode. Because they showed it twice. They showed it once where the focus was all on the show. And then the second time, they showed it where the focus was all on the people in the crowd. And you just had to know what was going on with the shuttle when they, and and if you'll remember, I remember distinctly there was very little immediate shaking response. It was like they couldn't believe that it happened. I mean, it was like it was still going up, and that and the and the realization that they that the sons of daughter and uh, had died had just not settled in. Well, it wasn't clear initially that the people died. That was that took over some uh, some time time to establish. Okay, but it exploded way well, up there in the sky. Something happened. Yeah. Maybe the shuttle itself. Well, I mean, it, it, something something fell into yeah. the water and and. Oh, it could have been damaged. Yeah, yeah, maybe they could, they could have survived. Uh, okay. Yeah, you hope. Yeah. Right. You hope. Um. Uh, now there were some other things uh, issues surrounding the whole case that uh, bear on it. One was that uh, President Reagan had just made a speech. And he made some statements in the speech that could be interpreted more than one way. But one, one 
way that many NASA people took it was that the success of this flight had a lot to do with their funding, NASA's funding, uh, because there were, there were a lot of questions out there about whether or not uh, exploring space was a good place to put a lot of money. Uh, and so the, a lot of engineers actually said in testimony later that um, they felt pressured to have this flight go. Um, then there was another issue that was very emotional for uh, everybody. And that was that this was the first flight where you had somebody on the shuttle who was not a trained uh, astronaut. You had uh, the school teacher. And that was very significant because what they really wanted to demonstrate beginning at that time, that that, that flight of that sort is one that anybody who could get in an airplane and fly across country could get in a shuttle and go up in space. They really wanted to do all of that. All right. And uh, this was a case to prove that you didn't have to have all of this training, you didn't have to have super physical abilities, that you just get on and fly. And when she went down, there was a whole lot of, of uh, terrible feelings in the United States. There was one other one. That was the emotionally um, uh, stressful for MIT people. Who was? MIT astronaut, an MIT alum. Keep talking, Yeah, McNair. Yeah. As a matter of fact, when I met Dr. Ng, I gave a lecture into his class in the McNair building. Mm -hmm. Wasn't it McNair? Building thirty-seven. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, it was building thirty-four. Thirty-four. McNair was somewhere around in there. Yeah. Yeah. Did I pass by it? Because I remember seeing three buildings. Probably. Three buildings. Yeah. Okay. So Ron McNair uh, was a uh, team person, and he was on the flight. Uh, so there was so this particular issue was one that uh, was unique in many ways. Probably one of the let's say probably. The, the most important, unique way is that virtually the whole world participated in the thing. If, if by no other, if by no other way than just looking at it and having something to say about it afterwards. Okay. Um, uh, I wrote an article on it. I, not on it per se, but uh, I included it. At some point, I'll be able to get this up. Cool. Um, and while I'm looking this up, tell me what you think in terms of an ethical analysis of the whistleblower. Do you remember his name? Beaujolais? Mm -hmm. At least that's where he pronounces his name. Uh, do you think he did the right thing? Do you think that uh, that the people who didn't pay attention to him did the wrong thing? He said we shouldn't fly and he went and told us. Which theory are you yeah. using? Utilitarianism? Mm -hmm. Categor categorical yeah. imperative or some other theory? Right. Okay. Yeah. So all of them, he did the right thing. For all of them? Yeah. Make your case. All right. Well, utilitarianism. If they listened to him, people wouldn't have died badly. Um, he 
he also, if he didn't say it after they died, he would have felt like, wow, well, I was a traitor of the dead because I didn't say it. Um, so it helps him, and it, it could have helped if they listened to him from the utilitarian point of view. And then from the impact on the categorical imperative point of view, he said what was right, regardless of the consequence. I mean, like the consequence had nothing to do with it. He just said what was right. So his job was at risk, and he could have thought, I should save myself. So from that other point of view, he did the right thing, not thinking of the consequence. So not thinking, not necessarily using Kant's theory about in a categorical imperative, but just not thinking about the consequences. There's some principle at work here that says, well, you should tell people when things are not safe. Um, and um, yeah, that was a cold morning and it went below specifications, but some of the engineers said, ah, well, it won't hurt anything. Uh, but now, there are some other points of view on this. But before I get to what people have said who've had plenty of time to think about it, I want to hear more about your initial, your views about it. What do you think about this? Thing? I'm trying to think about utilitarianism approach to his decision to tell managers that he didn't think it was safe. And I guess if he himself had the power to cancel the launch, then maybe utilitarianism would be more problematic because canceling the launch, if the O-ring was safe, would have a would produce a lot of pain for um, many parties involved, for NASA, for the, fund, the money that had been spent on other launch preparations. But he, in giving the recommendation that the launch shouldn't happen, didn't have the power to actually cancel the launch. So he was giving someone else the opportunity to make the decision. I don't really know what I'm going with this. Where I'm going with this. Okay. Except that, do you have to take into account the actual power that the person has to um, make the course of action, you know, follow through with the course of action? So, so all that Bujalay could do was give someone else a big decision to make with extra facts. So certainly from a categorical imperative point of view, he wasn't like infringing on anyone's rights. He was treating his managers as people who have the ability to reason, which seems to be what that approach to ethics would say is the right thing to do. I have a problem with it because I would apply the utilitarian approach because I just feel like there's so many uncertainties and it's so hard. You know, retrospect is a wonderful thing. We could sit around and look at it and say, you know, this is what would have happened, this is what would have happened. But from his point of view, it's really hard to implement that kind of approach because he had no clue the ramifications of his actions. You know, either he would present this data and say we shouldn't or he would say nothing, but I don't think he was truly aware of what it really meant, or maybe he didn't think about it, or he didn't sit down and weigh all the options that people will actually die, or what does this mean for NASA if I say this and we don't launch, will all our funding, I don't know if he weighed all the options, or was even clear what they were at the time. Okay, let's talk about complexity a, bit, uh, uh, a little bit. Let's make it more complex. Um, and see if there's a way to think our to think through something that's really is complex, uh, we have to we have to have the opti have to have the um, optimism that even when it comes to engineering that we do every day, all of the things that can happen to our design, somehow or another we get these models and we get through it. Can we do the same thing with an ethical problem with all of these complexities? I'm going to add another complexity to it. Uh, there's a man by the name of Hans Mark. You know him? I, is he at Texas? Uh, he's, he is he's not. He, he's still at yeah, Chancellor at the University of Texas. Yeah, I just remember hearing his name. Oh, you're, and you remember that name? Because <laughs> it's a distinctive name, yeah. 
Yeah, he was at NASA. He, um, for several years, was uh, the uh, number two man at NASA. He, he was the one that gave the final say-so, yes or no, for shuttle flights. Uh, and um, I don't recall if he gave the yes or no for the Challenger, but I think he did. It's a good thing for you to look up. Uh, I knew him. Hans Mark was what, what I would call a basically decent person. Basically decent person. Uh, he said, he, I wrote this article, and I'm going to give you two complexities in this thing. What I said in it, and I think I told you all that, I think I, I had to restart this thing to get it up on here. What I said in this article was that lethality was a part of engineering. I said, we can draw lines and say that th some things are too risky. We can draw lines and say that some things are unlawful. There's a certain risk factors that you have to observe. I said, but we cannot, nor is there ever any intention to get engineering down to zero risk. We're always going beyond uh, what science can tell us is truthful. And in some inst in, in an instance, I made the argument that we're going beyond what most ethicists, if not all ethicists, have tried to tell us in terms of reasoning things out. And that is to say, we, do we engineers get into situations where you have to make a decision right away. You don't have time to think about it. Not only that, it's a novel situation, so you couldn't practice for it. So how do you get through? And there are systematic ways to get through this. We're not just left at the elements. Uh, but that we have to take, in, take, take all of that into account. Hans Mark, I, didn't I tell you the story about this news article? I had to meet with these people. They told me I had done this horrible thing to engineering. Um, I looked yesterday for this thing. I can't find it. Uh, I know what, there's a copy at home. I'll get my wife to fax it to me. When we get back, I'm going to give you the reference for it now, okay. anyway. So maybe you can find it. Um, uh, yeah. And Hans Mark read, read that article. And he read it on the plane going from Washington to California. And he wrote me a letter on the plane. And when he got back, he had his secretary put a paper that he had written together and sent the whole thing to me. And he said he just couldn't stop thinking about the article. What he had said in his paper, and I'll, until I get the paper, I know where the paper is, it's in my office back at Howard, I'll bring it back when I go, come back up here. But uh, so I haven't. I, so I want to read to you what he said. But I'll tell you now what I recall what he said, and I've carried it with me all of these years. What he said was that every time he gave the order to fly, there was a group of engineers saying that the flight was going to explode. And somewhere in their arguments, if you look further that further enough down into it, the A, B, C, D as to why it was going to explode, the O-rings were in there. And he said that either this country has a commitment to go or it doesn't. Now, can you justify that? The important thing is that that is a hard reality. Hard reality. So every time, uh, let me see, I'll get it right now. Let's see. Yeah. I think it uses, you've seen a number of these. Uh, 
that to be released. That's it right there. Um, let me get the lights just for a second. <coughs> Thank you. Um, this is okay. This is the Washington Post. It's in the outpost section of the post. Uh, that is me. The title is The Slippery Ethics of Engineering. Uh, and this is December 26, 1986. Day after Christmas. Sunday morning. Okay. Uh, and there is a picture of the shuttle. I'm sorry, the Challenger. Uh, the Post got these from stock photos. Do you all remember, you all ever heard of the Bhopal case? Okay, we're going to cover that one. That was a case where um, the issue was whether or not the safety standards you use in the United States should be the same or higher any place else. And this U.S. company had a division in India, and they had lower standards over there. And, uh, and there was a chemical problem, and a lot of people got killed, including little babies. So they put that in the papers, and the whole world exploded. <laughs> wow. Yes. The image that they included with your editorial made such a difference. In well, response. they yeah. said that I, everybody said that I was saying that engineers kill people. And my response to that, I had two responses to that. First was that, well, we don't want to do this. We don't like this, but there's somewhere in here where lethality is part of what we do. That's what Hans Mark was really saying. Now, how can you justify that, or can you justify that? I want to go into that today. Uh, and um, uh, so you can't get that lethality part of it uh, out of engineering. For me, the question was, I had two questions. Are we going to do engineering? Or are we going to change engineering to something else? Engineering as it is uh, does not have to be this. I'm not so sure it's escapable from this. This, Three Mile Island, yeah, you, you all are pretty young for that one too. Uh, you ever heard of it, the Three Mile Island case? You ever heard of the Three Mile Island case? Okay. Uh, I'll, we're going to do that one too. I think that's listed here someplace. I have a personal experience with that. I went to work with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, two months after Three Mile Island. <laughs> yes. Uh, okay, we're going, to dis we're going to discuss this too. But we've got some issues on the floor. I mean, uh, how do you deal with this case that if you want to be really good and safe, that you cannot always do engineering? And tell me if you believe that's true or not. The important thing is, if it is true, what do we do about it? Can we justify it? Can we not justify it? Do we have to change what engineering basically is? That's a learning discipline. Uh, so, um, See if you can't get a hold of this, and if you can't, even if you can, I'll bring back my Xerox copy from home, but it'll be a couple of weeks. And if you do get it, please tell me how you got okay. it. Okay. Uh, the Washington Post seems to be reluctant to want to give uh, back issues that go back more than six months. I tried to log on and get a, become a member of uh, what they call it. I forgot it, what it is. But I had some difficulty and I just gave up. So maybe you could be more successful. Maybe there's some copies of uh, old issues in the library. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, because they have these big books, so big, and they keep all issues and you just go back and just pull one out. And if you do that, um, then uh, I'll reimburse you, whoever gets it, if you make Xerox copies for the rest of it. That's good to get you in the library. Okay, I'll leave some, some questions out there. What does that have to do with academic tenure? Oh, 
<laughs> um, when this issue came out, uh, I was invited. I was chair of the ethics committee of the AAES, the American Association of Engineering Societies. I tell you what, let me go back through this story. We got time. Let me go back through this story. Okay. Hope you don't get bored with it, but I won't make it long. Mm -hmm. All right. um, the uh, engineers were complaining that they did not have as much influence in Congress as the physicians did and as the scientists did. And somebody told them that the physicians had the New England Journal of Medicine and the scientists had the AAAS, where you could get one voice for the whole of them. And that was more powerful than the engineers coming in there from the American Society of Civil Engineers the IEEE, the AICHE, and all of those. So they formed one group in imitation of the AAAS, uh, and they called it the AAES. Okay. And the members were not individuals. They were the societies. And their representatives were the presidents of those societies. And they formed the board. And that board um, had this had this, when this article came out, had a special meeting and asked me to come to the meeting. They, the word ask is very polite. I had to go. <laughs> so I went to this meeting. And I walked into the room and there's this long board table. And all of them were sitting on one side of the table. And they had this one little lone chair on the other side. And I was invited to sit there. And all of them had copies in front of them of this of the Washington Post. Uh, now, let me give you a little background on that. It wasn't just an article in the Washington Post. This thing uh, was syndicated by the Los Angeles Times News Service. It was repent, reprinted in the London the Times, all sorts of places. They said it was going to go out to four or five hundred uh, newspapers, and that. Uh, a hundred million people were going to read it at minimum. Okay, so the engineers really felt bad that this thing has gotten out all over the world. Uh, the uh, uh, so um, so uh, when I uh, went in there, the first person to speak was immediate past president of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. And he leaned across the table and he pointed his finger at me and he said, Taft Broom, what you have done, just done has caused more damage to the engineering profession than any other single act in history. Now that's a direct quote. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> and I stayed in there with, with them two and a half hours. We went through every line. And at the end, they went down the table and each person had their say. And each person said what had just been, except for the first one, what said what the previous person had said. They said that everything in here was true, but that I should not have told them. That's that loyalty thing again. It's very strong all the way to the top. And then uh, when it got around to me, uh, what I told them was uh, that uh, how can the AAES ever presume to say to have an important say so to Congress if you don't have the power of life and death? I'm going to ask them, I said, how many of y'all are going to take me out for a drink? Three of them did. <laughs> uh, when I finished the drink, got back to how literally the dean was standing in the hall. And he said, the president of the university wants to talk to you. And I had made full professor at the time. <laughs> I had tenure, but I had not made full professor. So I went to my office. I called the president's office. The president got on the phone. And he said, well, I want to let you know, and these were his words exactly, quote, the captains of industry want your head. End of quote. I said, I think I know what you mean by that. Uh, 
Howard has just gotten a, a chemical engineering wing gift uh, from one of their oil companies. Uh, and they were threatening uh, the president with all of these things that they were no longer going to give to Howard if they, he did not fire me. And so I said, well, Mr. President, that's the way we talk to our presidents now. I said, well, Mr. President, what did you tell him? And he said, well, I told them that I would like to fire you, but that you have tenure. Okay. Now, the lesson that I learned from that was not so much that academic tenure was powerful. That the holding of academic tenure was powerful. What I learned from that was that the president was so glad that I had academic tenure. <laughs> because look what kind of life he would have to lead if every powerful person out there could intimidate him with money. Not only that, but 75, sorry, two-thirds of Howard's operating budget comes as an act of Congress. And they have power over the, uh, the committee that provides that funding. They were threatened and cut down. Now, what kind of life would a president of a university lead if he or she had to bend to the will of these powerful people? Every time some faculty member said something, <laughs> tenure was the greatest thing for him. <laughs> no, so, sorry, my tenure was the greatest thing for him. Okay, that's the argument that I made. Okay, so, there's, so the point that I'm making here is that we're not dealing with some trivial uh, theoretical, not that I have anything, any problems with theory, but we're not dealing with anything trivial here. This thing hit the world with a sledgehammer. Okay. Can you yes. repeat what is it that you actually said in the article? Uh, what I said was that um, I, this wasn't my original name for it. Oh, of course. The, the, the editor changed that name. The, my, my original name for it was uh, Cicero is dead, period, long live te technology. And Cicero had said that the safe, quote, the safety of the public shall be the highest law. And I was saying that engineering, the safety of the public, is not the highest law. That was my thesis. Don't get it out here that the, that the highest law that we try to deal with is no harm. That is not what engineering is all about. And so I went through and made that case. So you're saying as engineering is the highest law, it's not to no harm, but perhaps engineering, do you hold out that perhaps engineering should have that as well? Not a good question. Now, I'm here to finish this book on philosophy of engineering. Right. And one of my, uh, probably the biggest point I have in there is what is the highest law. <laughs> right. I, I'll give you a hint as to what it is. Uh, and before the class is out, I think I'll, I'll be able to give you um, some of the, what I call the high points of that book. Uh, what I say is that uh, I break all learned disciplines in three categories. You can guess what they are. Regal, priestly, and popular. Okay, those are the points of, of uh, social order. And I said that engineering is a regal discipline. The king wants to build a road. Okay, that's why we have what they call imperatives in engineering. Where do the imperatives come from? Not out of the sky, but from a regal point of view that says we want to hold society intact. And we want to do it. Ah, come on, give it a chance. Yeah, yeah see, Plato, I wouldn't call him Rico, but he's in the upper class, the aristocracy. Mm -hmm. It's, 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 it's an aristocratic yeah. position. Yes. Yeah. Really looking for. But the middle class, maybe the third thing. The uh, popular. The popular is only close to the middle class view, which is what Aristotle is. And I'm trying to say what engineering is. Only in my last chapter did I, do I start talking about what I think engineering should be. And that's out of four, 13 chapters are laying down what I think it is and has been since day one. Now, what it should be is a different story. Well, this, that, we got time to just to say this last point. That engineering, uh, I'm talking about engineering as a learning discipline. Um, I'm talking about engineering when it got into university courses of study. I'm not talking about the pyramids. I'm not talking about the Great Wall of China. I'm talking about when those artisans met uh, calculus and physics. And that is the beginning of what I call uh, engineering as a learned discipline. Uh, 
why did, on what account did people say we want these artisans to come together with uh, physics and math? Because the military wanted calculus to do co <laughs> calculations on trajectories for cannonballs and other things. Okay, so in the military, uh, the um, mission is more important than the soldier. Basically, that's why soldiers get killed. So we come into engineering with a higher principle. That is, and, and I call that regal. Uh, Dr. Moses would say that that's platonic or aristocratic. or aristocratic. It's coming in, it's saying the same thing, different angles, mm -hmm. that when you come in from the military, you do have a higher principle than the safety of the men. It's the mission. So I, I, S is what I am about with this engineering. Should be, well, maybe you all can write a paper on it. <laughs> probably tell me where you can publish yeah. it too. <laughs> I'm just thinking about all the, what I can, an, another kind of engineering that happens when members of a society or members of a town, especially in developing communities, come together and do engineering in, or, in order to make their town or society work better. So the creation of what doesn't already exist in order to improve their lives, which is sort of comes from the bottom up instead of from the top down. But that's not professional engineering as you're talking about it. Oh, it so is. Oh, it is. There are two things about that that have already come out. Uh, two things. Uh, one is... Um, uh, I'm going to give you a name. Richard Sklove, S-C-L-O-V-E. Incidentally, MIT, PhD. He, st he started something. Um, he, he wrote a book. Mm -hmm. And his book uh, tries to apply what go the something that goes on in Denmark to the United States. In Denmark, they have this concept of, I'm trying to think of what the exact name of it is, but it's where you have, we actually, you buy engineering advice pretty much like you go to the store. Okay, that, uh, and Sklove has not written a whole lot of books, so if you look him up, you'll find, I think, maybe two or three books, and the one that I'm talking about will be obvious by the name. Okay. Okay. Uh, and um, there's a name, it's a, very, it's a very pedestrian name that he has for the, that they have for this concept but it seems to work over there. The second thing is that I went to a conference once and a woman, I gave a talk and a woman came to talk to me afterwards and she identified herself as the sister of um, uh, he ran for president in the last election. He, he's he, he, what's his name? Uh, I'm having a, what they call a senior name. <laughs> so I know this guy. What, he, he ran for president. For nominate for Democrats or Republicans? No, he, obviously not. He ran as an independent. And he has, he's known for, he sued one of the automobile companies. Oh. What's Nader. Nader, Ralph Nader. Nader. Ralph Nader. She, entered, she uh, identified herself as the sister of Ralph Nader. And she said that in up here in New England someplace, uh, there's a town. Mm -hmm. And they have the city engineer and the mayor. Mm -hmm. But the citizens have their own engineer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. As a second opinion uh, for all of this stuff. And they call that community engineering, mm -hmm. which is not out of the realm of what you're talking about. It's not out of the realm of what this... Dick Sklove is talking about. So there are ideas out here, okay, about a new kind of engineering. None of them, I think, have yet surfaced as university courses of study. And to fit into what I'm talking about, that's what it has to, has to do. It has to fit into a university course of study. Then I can talk about a new kind of engineering. But yeah, there's new kinds of engineering out there. Come, and some of it's coming down the pike, and some of it may hit courses of study. All you have to do is have a professor say, you're going to 
he or she's going to do it, or a grad student <laughs> to say they want to take a course in it. So yeah, there's something coming down. Not only that, but we have not even explored. All I'm talking about, notice, all I'm talking about is the United States. There's a whole other world out there. We need to get all the students, everybody involved. Well, who knows what's going on in there. Denmark is the only time I went outside of the United States. Okay, um, so we got all of this, all of these complexities with this Challenger case. Uh, let's see what we can do with some of the uh, analysis points. With some of the analysis points. Um, I would think that the um, the principle that Hans Mark is working on is a principle that is a contract. I think that Hans Mark is going to be able to point to some place where the American public has given NASA a mission to do these things and has said do them and not necessarily be constrained by all of the principles of science to do them and they certainly would not say don't be constrained by all of the principles of ethics to do them, but I think that that's the way he interpreted that. That the people at NASA have a contract with the American people. And most of that contract, but not all of it, uh, is formally made through the representation of the, quote unquote, the people to NASA. So he's going to use a, now, now there's a term here that is going to be tricky. It would seem like a good term for this kind of contract would be what you would want to, would be social contract. Well, there's already the term social contract in philosophy and in political science that means something else. So um, let's not use that term. Let's reserve it for, for something else. I'll get into that at some point in time. I'll definitely get into it. But it's, it's a contract that, uh, that he would say is what he has with the American people. And as long as this affected nobody else other than American people, then if Hans Mark was sitting here, he would say, if, if you don't want us to do it anymore, make some new laws. Or give NASA a new mission. Um, I f have to apologize, but I forgot. But I had a newspaper article, um, and I can tell you right where it is right now. It's on my uh, dining room table in my apartment. I forgot to bring it. I apologize. But it's common knowledge, and I was hoping to get Sheila Widnall over here. I had invited her. She hadn't gotten back to me. But NASA, uh, the 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 the, the, the the uh, conclusion made about this and about uh, the um, Columbia from the standpoint of uh, investigating committees out of Congress was that NASA got into these problems because it had a certain cultural problem of get the thing done, make the deadlines. It, it was a kind of a culture that pervaded over everybody. And, and, and in a sense that is not too um, polite, it, it, it makes it sound like people say, well, the culture made me do it. Well, I, I, I use that term because I know that having used it, you won't forget it. Now that I've used it, let me say that there's, there's, it, it, there's some justification for that. I'm not saying entirely justified, but what, what happens is, is that people just get in a mode doing things every day. I work for NASA. I held grants for NASA for 12 years. I feel like an insider with NASA. I have, I have an emotional attachment to NASA. Uh, but I don't think that justifies what they do. But I think it explains it. Now, the, the report never said that, 
that, except for the whistleblowers, as I recall it, that there are other people who disagree with that. They just said that this whole man's culture is. Now, say that, if I get uh, Dr. Whitnall, who's here at MIT, I don't know if you know her. She's a, I don't know if she'll uh, really want to come, but I invited her. She said she'd think about it. Uh, and I invited her to talk about the ethics and the facts, but if she does not want to talk about the ethics and just talk about the facts, that's I, good I enough. She, what, the culture that they are concerned about is what they call the safety culture. The safety culture. And after the Challenger, there was a lot of attention paid to safety, and that eroded over time, and as you point out, the issue of time and budget, et cetera, took over, and the safety issues were became less and less uh, important to the people. And so we got the Columbia uh, situation. And so uh, there's a lot of attention now being paid to the safety issues uh, and how they're going to embed that into NASA, et cetera. And we have another faculty member. Maybe you can get her to come. She, but she's only available on Friday. Uh, her name is Nancy Levison, yes. who is the safety person that NASA is hired, and that's why she's only here one day a week. She's spending all her time dealing with NASA issues on how to embed this safety culture into the organization. All right. Well, Nancy Levison is, is going to get an invitation to either come or interact well, with something. Well, would have, probably have to be in another, uh, in another time. Well, you she, know, that might be an occasion where we can have our special class. Just have it on a Friday when she can come and have her lead the discussion. I worked with her once. Uh, uh, it was with, um, you got to get ready to go. Um, I'll but anyway, that's where we are. I think we've covered all the housekeeping issues. Am I right? Uh, should we be prepared to do another case on Tuesday? Yes, we're, you should be prepared to finish the Challenger case and to do the uh, Fort Pinto case. Okay. Okay? Good. All right.